So I'm going to leave the modesty for the rest of the year. But the fact is, New Hampshire is the most important place on the planet right now for liberty. And we're seeing more happening here than we are in the rest of the world combined. I mean, certainly the folks in Egypt and Tunisia, they're working on a long way to go to get here. We got a big lead on them. And when it comes to organizations in New Hampshire that are doing something far and removed, the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance is the organization that's getting the most done. So with its gold standard, with the endorsements of, of uh, you know, politicians that have a liberty leaning, giving people a target to shoot at, endorsing uh, candidates and, and promoting them with the PAC, this is the organization to support in New Hampshire. This is the one to watch. For those of you who are in the Free State Project, I think likely you agree with me that uh, the Free State Project would be a, a shotgun blast of porcupine quills all over the state if it wasn't for the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance. Um, that that it is a, uh, it, it's a focusing uh, factor I have yet. I've heard many stories on the, the origins of the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance. It's kind of like the Batcave. I'm not exactly sure where it came from. But whoever got together and created this organization, God bless you, because you've done great work. For any of you folks who are not currently dues paid members, and by that I mean this year, um, please get a hold of Eileen and uh, talk to her about membership. We can make it very easy for you. Remember that the Political Action Committee is integral in getting Liberty candidates selected here in New Hampshire. New Hampshire Liberty Alliance, the most powerful groups in lobbying for liberty in the world, in my opinion. We have a reoccurring donation for 2012. The, uh, this pack is, because of the presidential campaign, this pack is going to be all that much more important for the, uh, the election during 2012. And I'd like to introduce to you our keynote speaker, Larry LaPole. Larry lives and works in the Boston area where he runs the uh, Equity Management Associates, an investment partnership that focuses on selecting equities based upon their risk-reward characteristics. He's been a professional investor for more than 30 years. Larry became involved with the Liberty Movement through the Ron Paul Forums at ronpaulforums.com. Fortin Grassroots Group. He led the community effort, which uh, created two um, advertisements to support the 2008 presidential candidacy of Ron Paul. The first was a full-page advertisement in USA Today promoting Dr. Paul, helping him gain exposure and raise money. The second was a full-page advertisement. I saw this one in the uh, New York Times. I found it to be very motivating and, uh, and prescient, which was a narrative explaining why Dr. Paul was so important in the 2008 election. Larry, thank you for that one. Larry's brief presentation will be about his current investment focus, Monetary Chaos. Larry LaFold. If you'd like the ads, the designer of the ads is right there with the, uh, with the camera. Linda, get a fabulous... Um, first of all, thank you to the... Um, Thank you to the New Hampshire Liberty Alliance. Uh, it's an honor to speak to you. Uh, this is a great group. Um, thank you, Arlene. Thank you, everybody else. Uh, that was the founder of the Alliance. Um, you know, this is the kind of thing that it's going to take to fix the problems that we've got. And uh, you guys probably are one of the better groups in the entire country in terms of uh, making. Yeah. 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 I was blown away when I heard the state budget went down 11 percent last year, sitting next wow. to the speaker. Well, sorry. <laughs> I get it right. Uh, I, I was I was blown away. Uh, that's you know that's the right direction. You've got to keep going that way. And when I drove up here, I thought to myself, well, I don't know how friendly and proud this is going to be. And you know maybe this will be good, maybe this will be bad. I, I tend to be a little bit of a bomb thrower, as you'll hear. And uh, yeah, when I when I drove into the parking lot, I saw a few Ron Paul bumper stickers, and that encouraged me. But the one that really got me excited was somebody had a bumper sticker out there that said, "Support our troops." We need them to overthrow our, our government. <laughs> <laughs> to set the tone, I'd like to start off with just a 
you quotes. I always try and do this just so you kind of know where I'm coming from. I saw a quote two days ago. I just thought it was brilliant. I just thought I'd share it with you. It's not really that apropos of liberty, but that was a great quote. Says, the problems we see in our society today are all the result of the same cause. People are meant to be loved, and things are designed to be used. Yet we are using people and loving things. What a brilliant quote. And the source was unknown, but I just thought, boy, that was very thoughtful. The next one is a favorite quote that I often use when I'm speaking anywhere, and I think it's a good one, too. Um, some of you may be familiar with Claire Wolf. She's a libertarian columnist. She's written some great books. Uh, she wrote uh, 101 Things to Do Before the Revolution. It's now 179 Things to Do. But Claire says, America is at that awkward stage. It's too late to work within the system, but too early to shoot the bastards. <laughs> I think Claire is right. And then the third quotes come from our third president, um, who I think is probably the finest man ever to be involved in politics, with Ron Paul being a very close second. <laughs> And some of you may have heard these quotes, and some of you may not, but if you haven't, well, you've obviously heard the second one, but the first one you might not have heard, and I think it's very relevant to what I'm going to speak about. If the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around them will deprive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless on the continent that their fathers conquered. I believe that banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties than standing armies. The issuing power should be taken from the banks and the Federal Reserve and restored to the people to whom it properly belongs. Thomas Jefferson. Another one that I think is very relevant for today from the Declaration of Independence. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same objective evinces a design to reduce people to utter des absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and provide new guards for their future security. To which I say, Amen, brother. I got you warmed up. Before I start with the body of the speech, I just want to say something I think is important. Okay? I'm an optimist, and I'm a Christian, and I believe that this story has a happy ending. The reason I say this is that some of the problems I'm going to talk about are depressing. My wife always cautions me and says that I have a tendency to walk into situations and say, hey, the world is going to end. Oh, by the way, have a nice day. <laughs> My wife is very social, and when we go out in social situations, she begs me not to talk about monetary matters. <laughs> Please don't talk about gold. Talk about the Red Sox, anything. Just do not talk about gold and the, and the financial system. You'll turn people off. Everyone thinks you're a nut. The reason I add this preface, I think it's important, is to assure you that it's not all gloom and doom. In fact, there's, there's too much of that in the world already, and the system is broken, but I'm like Reagan. I believe that with all of this shit, there must be a pony in here somewhere. <laughs> so I say, have faith, this too shall pass, and things are going to get much better. Okay, but let's dive into how bad they are, all right? So the title of the speech is Monetary Chaos, the Future and How We Get There. Folks, America is in a very tough place right now. Something is wrong. It's very wrong. We can all sense it. And yes, we've not even begun to face the problem yet. Morally, we've lost our way, and it all starts with our money. The thing which is wrong is the money. We do not have a sound and honest currency. If you want to strike at the root, this is where you begin. The U.S. Federal Reserve System prints money with a stroke of a computer key. This is immoral, and it is theft. The people who run this system tell us that they are essential to our economic well-being, and inflation of 1 to 2% per year is good for the system. Bullshit. It is good for them, and it is good for the people who get the money first. It's not good for you and me. So I'm not, I am only going to steal 1% to 2% of your money, and this is a good thing because I do not take the other 98 to 99%. How about if I cut off 1% or 2% of your arm every year? How would that feel? The fact that we have fallen for this and let them do it is an enormous mistake. The corruption of these people knows no limits. As an example, right here in New Hampshire, we have the former Senator, Judd Gregg. Senator Gregg fought hard to prevent an audit of the Federal Reserve, and for his efforts, he is now a well-paid consultant and lobbyist for Goldman Sachs. Probably making over half a million dollars a year. How convenient. 
I believe that we are at a great turning point in history. We are like America and Germany in the 1930s, or America in 1976, or even America before what we euphemistically call the Civil War, but which was really the federal takeover of the free states on behalf of the northern mercantilists and business interests. There's a, term for what we are, there's a term for what we are facing, and it is called the fourth turning. The term grew from a book of the same name by William Howe and Neil Strauss. Howe and Strauss are preeminent social scientists, and they have studied the cycles of history. In 1995, they wrote that, the, that beginning in or around 2005, the United States would experience a crisis. A crisis of the magnitude of the American Revolution, the Civil War, or the Great Depression and World War II. It would be what they call a fourth turning. The fourth turning is the season of winter and destruction. It involves a crisis that once resolved brings about a new social order. Think about how the social order changed after World War II, the Civil War, and the Revolution. Every 25 years, a new generation emerges, and each generation is born in a season that corresponds to the seasons of the year. The last winter season was World War II. Spring began in 1946 and lasted until the early 60s when the military-industrial establishment assassinated President Kennedy. This event signaled the beginning of summer. Summer lasted until the mid-80s and, and was a turbulent time with protests and a new generation questioning the values of the older generation. Fall is the season of the last hurrah and became a reprise of spring, but on a much more corrupt basis. When fall ended is somewhat debatable, but the dot-com crash was probably the beginning of the end, and certainly the global financial crisis sealed it. We are now in winter. Recall that I said that winter is the season of destruction, and everywhere we look we can see the effects of this destructive winter. First, our federal government is completely broken and dysfunctional. They can't agree on anything. Recently, cutting 4% of the budget deficit became impossible. And this is at a time when the budget deficit is equal to 40% of the entire budget. Our federal government is hopelessly corrupt, and the voice of the people is no longer heard or represented. 90% of the people in this country opposed the 2008 $700 billion TARP bailout of the banks and Wall Street gamblers. And yet, when threatened by the supreme financial terrorist, Hank Paulson, Treasury Secretary, former CEO of Goldman Sachs, and recipient of a $200 million tax break, our government caved and sold us out down the river. Pay us $700 billion or the economy gets it in the head, they said. If that is not terrorism, then what is it? It is certainly theft. Frankly, with the exception of the government murder of JFK, this was the most brazen government criminal act of our time. <laughs> If you have not seen it, you must buy and see the brilliant documentary, Inside Job, that was compiled and directed by Charles Ferguson. He won an Oscar last year for Best Documentary and it deserved it. Every American should own a copy of this film. If the average person truly understood what the financial elite have done to us, we would be in the street with pitchforks, torches, and tar and feathers. Think of the technological progress that we've made in the last 30 years, and yet our lifestyles are getting worse. We all struggle to get by. It doesn't make sense. People need to connect the dots. The ultra-rich, the insiders, and the elites are getting richer, and the rest of us are paying $4 a gallon for gasoline. This is all because of the way the monetary system is set up to favor the rich and the insiders. But this is not all. The destructive effects of our broken system creep into every area. Unemployment is high and persistent. Good jobs have been sent overseas because our corporations care only about profits and not people. Corporations have the rights of individuals, which is a tragedy, or so says the Supreme Court. As, as Jefferson warned, all the branches of government support one another, and the only way to solve this is a revolution. Inflation is raging, food costs are out of control, and yet the federal government tells us inflation is 1 to 2 percent. What a blatant lie! <laughs> Shadow government statistics, an outfit run by John Williams, an honest economist, tells us that inflation is actually 9 to 11 percent per year if you calculate it the old way before they changed all the rules. And by the way, they're trying to change it again right now to, to dumb it down. My, my in-laws, who live off of their Social Security check, have not had an increase in that check in two or three years, and yet their cost of living goes up every year. So the government's lying to us, and we know that, but why don't we hear about it? Because the government lies to us using statistics. Is it a surprise? No. Hell, we had a president who lied about having sex and another president who lied about weapons of mass destruction. We were fighting four wars with unclear goals and several of them are undeclared. We ship billions of dollars in aids to overseas governments and yet we have people in our country who are suffering mightily. Money talks and lobbyists control the agenda in Washington, D.C. Corruption exists everywhere and the entire U.S. political system has become one large pay-to-play game. Corporations are people, and contracts are made to be broken. The system works for the powers that be, but not for the rest of us. Sounds bad? Well, it is. 
But, in my humble opinion, there is a God, and he has a sense of humor. How do I know this? Because he imbued the elites with an unrealistic sense of themselves, otherwise the Greeks call it hubris, and they have come to believe their own bullshit. <laughs> they think they're better than us, and events are proving in spades that they are not. They think inflation is okay when we know it is theft. They think they can blackmail us with threats of collapse, and we know that if we return to honest money, all that will collapse is their power. Yeah. They tell us how to live, but we don't have to listen. We outnumber them 100 to 1. Salt of the earth, honest people who work a day for a day's wages. Furthermore, they can no longer bullshit us. The internet and the alternative news operations are replacing the party line that is fed to us by the Ministry of Truth. They cannot piss on our leg anymore and say it is raining. The piss is just too obvious. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about monetary chaos. Money is a unit of account. It's supposed to be a store of value. Money should be divisible, uncounterfeitable, indestructible, and sound. For roughly 6,000 years of recorded history, mankind, through the marketplace, has determined that gold and silver are the superior forms of money. This is why the founders declared gold and silver to be money in our Constitution. Barter still works, and other forms of money have been tried, but at the end of the day, gold and silver will still spend just about anywhere in the world at any time. About the only drawbacks of gold and silver as money is that they're heavy and to a degree bulky, particularly silver. Well, to address this to address this, the Chinese were the first to experiment with paper money. They started issuing paper bills of script for gold and silver, and as long as the issuer was honest and willing to exchange the paper for actual metal, the system worked. However, even if you've not read the history, you can guess the end of this story. Someone decided that perhaps it would not hurt if they issued a little more paper than they had gold. Perhaps no one would be the wiser. It seemed like the proverbial free lunch, but in fact it was the apple that was offered by the serpent. It was a dishonest act and only bad could come from it. The laws of nature guarantee that there is in fact no free lunch, and both the party offering the free lunch and the party expecting to receive the free lunch are involved in a deception or fraud. This is what all fiat money systems throughout history have, have eventually failed, all of them. It is impossible for the issuers of fiat to restrain themselves and to not take advantage of the privilege of coining money. Man has fallen. This will never change. As an aside, on average, it has taken about 39 years for most fiat money systems to fail, and we became a complete fiat money system in August 15, 1971, the anniversary is coming up next month, when Nixon abandoned the gold standard by refusing to redeem U.S. dollars when the French asked for them. 1971 was exactly 40 years ago. Most systems fail in 39 years. Hmm. Here's the good news. Our corrupt system is built upon fiat money, and it is failing. The signs are everywhere. We're going to have to come to... We have come to a once in a millennia opportunity to completely reset this failing system. It, it need not even be that hard. Will there be winners and losers? Sure. But honest people who are willing to do honest work will be okay and will no longer be subject to the whims and depredations of the elite. Iceland is a great microcosm for a monetary experiment. Let's consider it. Iceland is a small, stable fishing economy in the North Atlantic. Their bankers got out of control and decided it would be a good idea to lever up and offer high rates of interest in order to attract large deposits. The Icelandic banks began paying rates of interest in excess of what they could earn on the deposits and did so by using leverage to enhance returns and by constantly attracting a growing stream of deposits. Using new money to pay out returns to early investors is what has come to classically be called a Ponzi scheme, named after Charles Ponzi, of early 20th century Boston fame. Ponzi schemes are very much like fiat money schemes, and they rely upon faith and new investors in order to keep them going. If either the faith wavers or the new investors stop investing, they collapse in a pile of losses. So back to Iceland. Iceland's bankers grew their deposits to the point where they were 15 times the GDP of Iceland. Balance sheets were enormously uh, uh, bloated, and when they could no longer grow or meet all of their application, obligations, they collapsed in a pile of losses. Many of the investors were Brits and Dutch, and so the British and Dutch governments bailed them out. Then these governments turned around and asked the government of Iceland to bail them out. <laughs> However, the government of... Yeah, exactly. They said, fuck you. <laughs> And they went to their people and they put it up to a referendum. And no surprise, 90% of, of the people said exactly what you said, sir. Fuck you. I'm not bailing you out. I sort of, I sort of right, prices went through a one-time upward adjustment and the economy came back to life. 
Now Iceland is doing just fine, thank you very much. Okay? Although, the bankers in Iceland did not do so fine, and their banks collapsed and they lost their jobs. What a shame. Interestingly, when the banks took Iceland down, the people in Iceland shunned the bankers. I, I read a lot about this, I love it. They poured red paint on their houses and cars, and they refused to speak to them. The bankers had to leave Iceland. Back to the U.S. Our response to a similar set of developments which manifested themselves in the global financial crisis which erupted in the summer and fall of 2008 was quite different. We bailed out the banks and investment banks, we assumed all of their bad debt, and we allowed them to continue paying outrageous bonuses, and we did not even put anyone in jail or undertake any real reform. In fact, Dodd-Frank, which is meant to reform the financial system, is in fact a bill that was written by financial interests and places onerous demands on small firms like mine while well, benefiting the entrenched financial firms like Fidelity. It's much easier for you to invest with Fidelity than it is to invest with me, even though I will do a much better job, and the reason is the government. The cost of the global financial crisis to the U.S. can be measured in trillions of dollars. We assume six trillion of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac debt, most of which is still held on balance sheet. We backstopped the banks and we provided emergency loan facilities to several, of several trillion dollars to companies and banks throughout the world, including a huge list of foreign banks. Why do we bail them out? They're not American. And organizations like McDonald's and General Electric. Why would McDonald's need capital from the government? Why not? It's free. So why not take it? Jeff Immelt, the CEO of GE, went to Hank Paulson and begged for an emergency loan. Jeff and I both attended Harvard Business School at roughly the same time. I became an independent businessman. Jeff became a crony capitalist. Without that loan, GE might have failed. And Immelt most certainly would have lost his job. What I would like to know is who is there to bail me out when I make a mistake? Like you, the answer is no one. This is blatant corruption. Of course their defense is everyone did it. Bullshit! You didn't do it. They did it. Our government bailed them out. It's a crime. Furthermore, the crime persists because it's not just the bailouts that stink to high heaven. Since the government has figured out other ways to cheat on its citizens. Look, let's look at interest rates. In order to help debtors and then turn punish savers, the Federal Reserve dropped interest rates to incredibly low levels and held them there for two years. Presently, CDs and insured deposits pay less than 1% per year. So let me get this straight. If you're like my mother and you have a nest egg, you're a realtor, you have a nest egg that's saved up your whole life, and you have about a million dollars, and you're in CDs, you used to earn 50000 a year, and you could live on that as a retired 75-year-old. At 1% interest, you earn $10,000 per year, and you have to either keep working or rely on your children for support. Savers are punished, and borrowers benefit. Meanwhile, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, and other prime dealers borrow from the federal government at 0.25%, and then invest the proceeds in the guaranteed government securities, which, by the way, helps the government hide the fact that it's bankrupt, which yield 3 4 or 5%. It's like a license to print money. I want some of that deal. Oops, no, I can't get it, because I'm not an approved government primary dealer. Nope, you can't get it either. You're not an approved primary dealer. But Goldman Sachs can get it, and the partners at Goldman Sachs are buying houses in the Hamptons with the proceeds from that deal that we all pay for. They pay men like Judd Gregg to do their bidding. Oh. Judd went to the right schools and knows the right people. We should be pouring red paint on his car. <laughs> The financial crisis of 2008 was, was the beginning of a much larger crisis. The U.S. government guaranteed debt and papered over unpayable financial guarantees. The FASB changed the accounting rules and allowed the banks to mark their assets to model. Because if they did not, they would all be bankrupt. Here's the deal, folks. Wall Street borrowed and gambled with a lot of money that was not theirs. Intrinsically, that's not illegal. It may be unethical or stupid, but it's not illegal to make financial bets. What is illegal is to make financial bets and then to not fulfill your obligations. In a capitalist system, if you cannot fulfill your obligations, you fail or you go bankrupt. Capitalism without bankruptcy is like religion without sin. As Elizabeth Warren, who by the way is one of the good guys, which is why she never get appointed to run that commission that she should be running, said, they had a hell of a business model. Gamble like crazy and if they won, they kept the proceeds. If they lost, the government, country, and taxpayers bailed them out. It was heads they win, tails we lose. Crime. Folks, the reason we pay $4 a gallon for gasoline today is because we bailed out the banksters. Pure and simple. People have got to connect the dots. In gold and silver terms, the price of gasoline hasn't changed in the last 20 years. 
Let's examine the nature of financial commitments. They say if you borrow a few thousand dollars from a bank and you cannot pay it back, you have a problem. In turn, if you borrow a hundred million dollars from a bank and you not, can, cannot pay it back, the bank has a problem. This is the issue with too big to fail. We need a constitutional amendment. Nothing is too big to fail. Not even the federal government. Insurance, guarantees, and derivatives. Insurance is a straightforward concept. All homeowners pay into a fund to insure against the risk that their house burns down. Regulators make sure the money is safely stored and protected. Reserves are held and probabilities are figured so that even if there's a large fire, all the homeowners will be protected. This is the way insurance is supposed to work and historically has worked. Parties to the contract had pure interest and incentives. The regulators made sure that the insurance companies didn't cheat and held reserves. And more importantly, the insurance companies had reputations to protect. Now, imagine financial deregulation comes along and all these rules are turned on their head. Reserves are optional, regulation is non-existent, and you no longer have to have an insured interest to play the game. Now you have a sense of what the derivatives market is all about. Derivatives allow anyone to bet on anything, and they require minimal disclosure, no reserves, no margin calls, and no insured interest. So I can insure your house against fire. I can even insure it against fire ten times over, and then I can go light a match in your garage. If you don't think it hasn't happened, then you're being naive. That's what these people are doing. They're robbing us blind. Warren Buffett said it himself. Derivatives are financial weapons of mass destruction. And yet his firm is one of the biggest players in the derivatives market. Go figure. His father must be rolling over in his grave. Today the world economy is about 50 trillion in size. Yet using the BIS statistics, there are over 600 trillion of derivatives outstanding. Why? because they're enormously profitable for Wall Street, and they allow the financial interest to manipulate every single market. They're, they're getting rich off this stuff, folks. This is why the top 1% have all the money, and the rest of us are paying four bucks. So where does it all end? Ernest Hemingway once said, in, when asked the question, how did one go bankrupt, he said, first, gradually, and then suddenly. <laughs> and the US government is bankrupt. The U.S. banks are bankrupt. The U.S. Social Security system is bankrupt. Our monetary system is bankrupt. The only unknown issue is how quickly everyone will come to the conclusion that the emperor has no clothes on. Yeah. All we're waiting for is a little boy. Ron Paul might be it. Based uh upon -huh. <laughs> current events, I would say that the time is measured in months or even a few years at most. These people are getting desperate. They're letting oil out of the strategic oil reserve. They're doing all kinds of things. I mean, this is the stuff that desperate people do. They know they're losing control of it. Silver went to 50. They, they hiked the margin on silver. In over two weeks, they hiked it five times. They went berserk. They, they know it. They see it. The system is falling apart, and they know it. Okay? The global financial crisis had a very negative effect on the US financial system, and by extension, on the US federal government balance sheet and income statement. These are interesting numbers. Before 2008, the federal government was running annual deficits of two to four hundred billion a year, which is enough. But it was on three billion of revenues, and you can figure out the percents. The bailouts, wars, guarantees, and other actions taken by the government to keep the system going changed all of that. In 2009, the federal deficit was over 1.1 billion, and this year it will be over 1.6 billion. It has gone up every trillion. year. Trillion. Trillion. I'm sorry, trillion. 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 Thank you for the correction. <laughs> Thank you. I misspoke. <laughs> over, 40 cent, over 40 cents of every dollar we spend is deficit spending. We either borrow the money from the Chinese or we print it. Print it. Hmm, let's see what that means. Quantitative easing. Please refer to your handout and flip to page two. The Bernat. Yeah, the Bernat. We're going to school. Look at the chart on the top of the second page. This chart shows the U.S. monetary base. U.S. monetary base is currency in, in circulation and reserves of banks, as reported by the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. That's the beast itself. Okay? What you can see is that from the 80s, the early 80s until 2008, there's a gently up sloping line which reflects the growth in the economy and a modest rate of inflation. What happened in 2008? Global financial crisis. It goes berserk, right? The line goes vertical. That, folks, is pure infl is inflation, pure and simple. Did the productive capacity of the United States double in 2008? Did the amount of oil coming into our country double in 2008? Did the amount of food around here double in 2008? No, but the money supply did. Twice as much money chasing the same number of goods, bingo, inflation. Even though they say we don't have it. 
This is why gasoline prices went from $1.80 in late 2008 to $4 a day today. Furthermore, if you think four is bad, wait until they hit five, seven, 10, or 20, because it's coming. <laughs> By the way, I figured out the cost of driving an electric car. It's five cents a mile versus about 20, 20 cents a mile for a 20 mile per gallon you know, regular US car. It's worth getting on the waiting list, I know I got. Um, you would like to think that 2008 was a one-off thing and that as Ben Bernanke promised, once the crisis passed, crisis passed, he would withdraw the stimulus, I'm almost done, to prevent inflation. <laughs> yes, that is what you would like to think, but you would be wrong, because 2008 was just a warm-up. When the green shoots died, we got quantitative easing, which is a euphemism for printing money or buying our own bonds. Quantitative easing one led to quantitative easing two, and now we have under the table quantitative easing, and no doubt it'll be followed by quantitative easing three, because if we don't continue to buy our own bonds, no one's going to buy them, and the system is going to collapse, which may happen. The monetary base, looking back at your chart on the top of page two, the monetary base, the line there, I have the exact numbers, grew 33% from December 31st, 2001 to this June. So that's in six months we went up 33%. So the whole notion that, oh yeah, we responded to the global financial crisis and we had to do that to save the system, but now that we save the system, we'll, we'll get rid of the inflation. Bullshit. Bullshit. Six months, 33%, that's a 66% annualized rate of inflation. If, like me, you have difficulty <laughs> reconciling this figure with the government CPI, which Ben Bernanke says is contained and in the 1% to 2% range, then you too have a functioning brain. <laughs> Ignorance is strength and lies are truth. Orwell would be proud of these jokers. Oh, and by the way, Ben Bernanke said under oath that he is not monetizing the deficit or printing money in front of Congress. He also made that statement on 60 Minutes. Of course, on another 60 Minutes show, he said that what they are doing is, in effect, printing money. He has not clarified in which 60 Minutes show he was being truthful. <laughs> he also sang the virtues of printing money in his white paper, which got him the Federal Reserve Chairmanship job to begin with. He said the U.S. has a technology, a digital printing press, that in effect allows the government to create unlimited amounts of currency, thereby preventing the horrors of the Great Depression. <laughs> By the way, the Federal Reserve was what created the Great Depression. The Federal Reserve started in 1913. <laughs> This guy's got it all wrong. He's a stooge of the moneyed interest. So here's the issue. There's just too much bad money out there and not enough good money. Countries, people, banks, others, they all owe more money than they can pay back. Think Iceland. We owe 15 times our GDP in derivatives. What we got to do, we got to just wipe this whole thing clean. There are trillions of dollars of derivatives. They're all worthless. There are trillions of dollars of bank loans. They're all worthless. We gotta just, it's like a jubilee. We gotta have a debt jubilee. And there are no free markets anymore because the markets are being manipulated. The whole thing is a Potemkin village or a house of cards that is gonna collapse. So to keep it going would require exponential growth of the money supply, 66%. And that means hyperinflation. Either we're gonna debase or default, and they both mean the same thing. Paper money is gonna become worthless. Contracts and obligations will disappear, and we will all have what we have, and that will be it. We will all have to live with our, in our means. The government, too, will have to live within its means. There will be no credit, because no one will trust anyone else's credit. And the only forms of money will be barter and gold and silver. Keep in mind that gold and silver are the only financial assets that are not someone else's liability. Let me repeat that. Gold and silver are the only financial assets that are not someone else's liability. It's incredibly important that you physical. understand that physical. Physical. Yeah, physical. This is going to be one of the largest one-time transfers of wealth in the history of the world. People with paper are going to become paupers, all those poor bankers. People with gold and silver are going to have capital and the money of the future. I foresee a gold price per ounce of a minimum of $10,000 and perhaps as high as $100,000. Both figures are very attractive compared to today's $1,500 price. I, I foresee a price per ounce of silver of $625 up to $6,250 per ounce, and these are based on the ratio of gold to silver of 16 to 1. Both of these figures are very attractive compared to today's price of $35 per ounce. And the reason the, the price is, we'll get to it in a minute, the reason the price is $35 an ounce is because every week on the COMEX, we trade more, in fact, in some days, we trade more silver on the COMEX paper market than is mined in this country in an entire year. That's just paper silver, folks. It's not real silver. 
So if you ask for the real thing, they'll try and get you not to take the real thing. There was a, there was a hearing of the CFTC in Washington early last year wherein the guy who runs the London Bullion Marketing Association admitted they were running fractional reserve mar gold market. And so that when you bought gold in London, unless you asked for and were willing to pay a premium for physical, you were buying a share in a pool of gold, which in that pool was, they, he admitted they had 1% gold against $100 of claims. Okay? Think about that. What happens when the other 99 people say, give me my gold, and it isn't there? That's how I get to 100,000 an ounce. So here's my thesis. Because we have printed too much money and made too many monetary commitments, the existing money is going to go bad. It's not unusual. It's happened before many times and places. The last two times it happened in the U.S. were the Continental, which was overissued to fund the war, and the Confederate dollar, which failed for obvious reasons. Because these two examples occurred so long ago, most Americans are not even aware of this issue. They're clueless. Interestingly, foreigners are way ahead of us on this one. I do business in Vietnam. Lots of uh, big transactions in Vietnam, they're conducted in gold. You buy a house, you pay gold. You buy a car, you pay gold. Everyone in Vietnam owns gold. Why? They've had a bunch of hyperinflation. They know the paper's no good. The, Chi um, the Chinese, the Germans in 23, the French with the Assignat, the Argentinians, the Brazilians, they all experience hyperinflation, and they're much more aware of this issue. These people know what Voltaire said to be true. Paper money eventually returns to its intrinsic value. Zero. <laughs> They also know that a debt cannot be repaid because of a counterparty risk is not a money good debt. Again, the only financial asset in the world without counterparty risk are gold and silver. Take a look at the handout I gave you. <laughs> On the first page, I, I showed you my investment holdings. On the second page, I show you the money supply being out of control. On the lower box of the second page, I show you how much currency is in circulation against the inflation adjusted. And this is using the numbers that are provided to us by the government, which are wrong. Um, uh, uh, price of gold. So here, gold could go up 5x from here, which would get you into the 9,000 area. But also notice how far over it went in 79 when people really desired gold. So I'm pretty sure that we're going north of 10,000. Look at the next page. The top of page three shows you, this is a very good chart done by an analyst that I follow, it shows you when the gold stocks are overvalued and undervalued relative to the metal. They've rarely been as cheap as they are right now. My fund last year was up 47% net of fees and carried interest. It was actually up 55 gross. Um, my fund this year is down 15% year to date. I'm in a hole. I mean, it's a drawdown. I don't like it. it bums me out. I suspect I'll be up 50 to 100% by the time this year is over. I've listed some books that I think are very helpful to read if you're going to become involved in stock investing. I've put down some websites that I go to on a regular basis. I think they might be of interest to you. Here's my parting advice to you. Live well. Enjoy the things that are important in life, your family, your friends, the freedoms that we do have. Save money every day. Learn and practice useful skills. Pray a lot. Hold your savings in the form of gold and silver and vote the bastards out and continue to do it until we completely reform this entire corrupt federal system. I did see a couple of questions. Actually, this young lady here asked one first. Go ahead. You have a problem. <laughs> I have a problem, clearly. Yes. According to this theory, yeah. What what would be what would be the advice to do now in, in 2011? What what would I what would I do with that? Could you repeat? Uh, I mean, sure. The question is, she has a hundred thousand. If hypothetically, if she had a hundred thousand dollars in the bank. What would be her? What would be my advice on her and what to do? I don't know your total financial picture, and I can't, you know, legally have to give a disclaimer. But assets, but in, in U.S. in U.S. dollars. Dollars. Okay. Well, having a little bit of cash around is always helpful, and I, I wouldn't advise you take the entire, entire hundred thousand dollars and convert it into anything because if you need some cash, you want to have some cash, right? And, and cost every time you change whatever form your money is in, there's a there's a friction, right? There's a one or two percent friction. So. 
start off, figure out what your rainy day money is and how much you need to live for a few months and so forth. The money that you consider your long-term savings or capital, I personally, if you're extremely conservative, I would buy gold and just gold, not silver. If you want to be a little, more, if you want to be a little more daring, I would buy gold and silver, in a weighting of perhaps 50/50. And if you want to be even more daring still, um, I would buy gold and silver and gold and silver mining stocks. Personally, 100% of my net worth is in gold, silver, and gold and silver mining stocks. 100%. Well, no, that's not true. I own some real estate, frankly, but my house. Um, but um, is real estate still? Well, real estate will have value. If you look at Weimar, what happened after Weimar, real estate will get. What's going to happen, in my opinion, we're going to have a new dollar. It's going to be it's going to be ten old dollars for one new dollar. Okay. Or five dollars, or whatever. You know, there's going to be some ratio. The old dollar's going to fail. There's going to be a new dollar. All the real estate will reprice in the new dollar. It's a thing. It's fixed. Unless it burns down, it's got value. It happens to be the area where the last bubble was. So I don't think it's a particularly good investment. You know, I think it could still go lower. But yeah. Well, um, with the the, the the sort of conservative thing to do in the past was always pay off your house and then think about some investments. With the way things are looking, <laughs> is the question: Do I should I mortgage my house to the hilt and then put my money into gold and silver, or somewhere in between? I don't want to give you that advice. Because I wouldn't say it either. Then yeah, be scared. Well, I don't want to give you that advice because the, the, the last thing you I mean, debt is debt, and if you can't service it, you lose the asset. The house is the asset. The debt is a debt. So I would be extremely careful about that. Having said that, I, I, you know, there are some things I've borrowed slightly against and put the proceeds into gold or silver because I'm absolutely convinced they're going to go up in a lot of value. And I know that the asset I borrowed against, I won't lose against. You know, I, I, can, I can service it. So my point, you know, yes, there's some sense in that. If the dollar becomes worthless and you owe people money, you're going to pay them back in worthless currency. Yes, there's some sense in that. But be extremely careful because you don't want to get blown out of your asset. For most people, I wouldn't recommend it. Back here. Yeah. Isn't it like uh, trading in gold bars, you know, like it's this physical thing? Isn't that very clumsy and you can't really make some bigger deals? Well, no, it's, let me explain how to do it. Um, there, there's certainly the security and the storage issue, and I'll give you some ideas on that. Um, and, and, there's, and there's friction going in and out. I mean, the, you, you, you know, gold, and gold bars and gold and gold coins typically have a spread between the buy price and the sell price of four to five percent. So, you know, every time you buy or sell it, you're losing a couple of points, right? I mean, I started buying gold in 2003, you know, four or five, I mean, it's up five times what I paid for it. I don't care about the two or three percent. Um, the best sources for holding gold, in my opinion, are overseas. There are two sources. One is called goldmoney.com. It's run by James Turk. He's honest. He's in London. And he will store your gold for you in Zurich. You pay an extremely small fee, I mean pennies, to have him do that. And so you open a gold money account, you wire them or send them money, and you can buy gold or silver online and it is stored in Switzerland so that if, if the government does an FDR and claims, you know, send in all your gold, um, you've got it overseas. The, the related service that I also use, I use them, the related service that I also use is called Bullion Vault. One word, bullionvault.com. And it's the exact same idea, but it's just in Zurich. Um, that's how I recommend buying gold and silver. Yes, sir. What are, you, what are your thoughts on Perth uh, silver stick? I think it's a pretty. I think it's a pretty good place. I've heard good things about it. I don't really. I've done the homework. I don't know enough to say, but I. But I've heard. I've heard good things. I think it's legitimate. I mean, Sprott has one. You know, there, there are a lot of different ways. I mean, the one thing I would not do. Let me just say this for everybody's benefit. I wouldn't just go buy GLD or SLV. These are run by the banks, and they probably have derivatives in them. There's, is there some gold there? Definitely. Is there 100 cents gold on the dollar there? I'm not sure, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ron Paul said that what we need is not any particular system of, of government money, but we need, we just need to let private companies provide whatever money people use. A lot of private economists will agree with them, like David Friedman. It suggests that probably what would happen if we just let things alone is that you'd still transfer money using Visa, but the the money would be backed by a hundred different commodities. And let me just make a quick case for why that's important. Because China was on an all silver money system in the 1920s and was doing great. And the FDR destroyed them by buying up a bunch of silver, raising the value by 30% and causing a deflation. So any system that's based on just a couple commodities can be manipulated. 
So I, I think we just need to stress the privatization. That's a fair point. That's a fair point. I mean, I'm all for competing systems of money. I happen to think the gold and silver will win if we do that. Yes, sir. Uh, Utah just passed a bill yeah. allowing gold and silver to be yeah. used as legal currency. Something I hope some of the state reps here decide to start doing in New Hampshire. <laughs> Robin Rand have just put up a bill, and so Jim DeMint actually was pleased to see it on it, trying to take away the capital gains tax on uh, gold and silver coins. Yeah. 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 Yes, sir. Uh, for the average family, would uh, long-term <coughs> food storage be something Absolutely. appropriate as a hedge against these events? www.emergencyessentials.com. Uh, I have almost two years of food in my basement. Yeah, it's um, rice, beans, grain, um, you know, freeze-dried MREs, you name it. I don't know that it'll come to that. I hope it doesn't. I don't think it will. I think people are incredibly resourceful. Um, you know, I think, we'll, I think we'll, we'll have chicken farmers sprouting up all over the place. A lot of food out there. A lot of food, yes, sir. I have a couple of questions. Forgive me for trying to make them. I'm all for ending the printing of paper money. Is there a gold and silver in the world? Totally fair question. Yeah, the, he said uh, he's all for ending the printing of paper money, but is there enough gold and the silver in the world to do it? That's what a Judd Gregg, that's the argument a Judd Gregg would make. Oh, we can't do that. There's not enough gold, silver, gold. No, no, I, excuse me, I was just asking a question. No, I don't, no, no, I'm not, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not jumping on you. I'm jumping on Judd Gregg. <laughs> 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 that, that, you, the answer is, of course there is. It's just at what price? It's just at what price? And once honest money is put into the system, these people can't rob us the way they've been robbing us. I mean, this is very, very bad for a Goldman Sachs, okay? Very bad. And it should be. It should be. They're criminal. What they've done is criminal. You know, they've, they've stolen people's savings. They've got retired people living on no cost of living increases when, they, when they're, and they're, they're boiling us as frogs. I mean, we're, fro we're frogs and we're getting boiled. The cost of everything I buy gets more and more expensive every single year. Yes, back here. What about energy? I believe in peak oil. I think we need to solve our energy problems. I've looked at, I'm on the list for an electric car. Um, you know, again, I, I think I think the free market will solve a lot of problems. Um, you know, I, I think we should end the oil subsidies. I think, you know, I don't think we need an energy policy. I think we need to break the energy monopolies that we have. I think we'd have a lot more um, energy and electricity and cheaper electricity if we didn't have the federal government system that we now have. I think we're paying way too much for everything as a result of the federal government. Um, so I've, I've been uh, paying attention to trading silver for a while, and we've had a lot of discussions about silver shorts with the likes of Goldman Sachs. With the change in Forex, where they're actually making it so that U.S. citizens can no longer trade uh, gold and silver right. I saw that. Yeah. as of July 15th. That's just with certain small brokers, but yeah. Um, the issue, so people like us will no longer be able to trade in long-term Forex contracts right. so that we can actually insure our money that way. Does that, is that a vehicle for the um, people who are holding those contracts that were going to go unfulfilled to turn them, convert them into Absolutely. cash, and Absolutely. basically eliminate Absolutely. the demand that could happen? Yeah, these people are incredibly vile and corrupt, okay? Can you get that in English? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> these people are incredibly vile and corrupt, and, and yes, that's exactly... That's exactly what he, his question was. Recently, they've changed some rules, and in Dodd Frank, they've made it some of these people, some of these forex brokers, are no longer able to offer long-term forex contracts and long-term contracts of gold and silver. And this is basically to help the trap long and silver shorts. And it's it's criminal. It's absolutely criminal. And this this again goes back to why you can't do business with these people. I mean, I don't you know you don't want to I don't want to do business with the big New York banks. I don't want to have a big New York bank credit card. I mean, I want to I want to shun these people. These people are bad. They're not Americans. They're bad. <laughs> They're doing the bad stuff, and we gotta stop it. Anything else? How do I really feel?
Thank you, Larry. So, um, that's the dinner, folks. Thank you for coming. So, uh, Representative Paul Brown from Raymond uh, was our 50-50 winner. Yay! He donated the whole of the winnings to the uh, Christmas. Yay! Folks, uh, one more thing. I forgot to mention that I host a radio show called Free Talk Live. You can do that. Freetalklive.com. Uh, we're on 109 radio stations as of 109. Is that how many it is? Yeah, I, it's hard for me to keep up. Uh, 109 radio stations across the country. Please, uh, you know, take a listen. And uh, we talk about liberty every issue, every time. Have a safe drive home. Great to have you.